Have you ever known someone and then discovered that you really didn't know that person? You sit back and you say, you know, how in the world could I have been so blind? But it happens to us all the time, doesn't it? Today we've gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of us have come into this place with an image, our own image, of who Jesus is, who we think he is. But the question is, do we really know him? In your notes, I gave you this passage, Ephesians 1, 17 to 23. It says this. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the holy people, his incomparably great power to us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him with his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all the things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, before I go any further, everyone, 13 years of age and under, disappear. Go that way. They are waiting for you. They've been waiting for you for 12 minutes. Don't want to go. <laughs> okay. Paul wants us to know Jesus better. That's what he says. I pray that the Spirit will give you wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. In verse 18, he says that you might know the hope of his calling, that you would have confidence that he's called you, that you can experience the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, that you can experience his incredible power, the same power that it took to raise Christ from the grave. He wants us to get to know Jesus better. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is far more than an empty tomb. And what I want us to do is I want us to take a look at Jesus this morning. And I'm going to call it the six faces of Jesus. First face is this. Baby Jesus. Uh, little baby Jesus lying in the manger. You know... People love baby Jesus. They sing about baby Jesus. They can't get enough of baby Jesus. Baby Jesus is cute. Baby Jesus is innocent. But more importantly, baby Jesus doesn't have any authority over my life. He's just a baby. He's not a threat to me. And somebody will say, well, wait a second. Baby Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's true. But people can very easily say God just decided he would come down and join our party. But if you only have baby Jesus lying in a manger, you don't have enough. You know, it's really interesting. Luke's gospel is the only gospel that talks about baby Jesus. You say, what about Matthew? Well, Matthew's gospel talks about Jesus as a toddler. He's already in a home when the wise men come to visit him. Mark's gospel and John's gospel don't have anything about baby Jesus. But we seem to love baby Jesus the most. Another face of Jesus is he is a great teacher. Now, the things that Jesus teaches are very powerful. If the world ran the way Jesus taught, the world would be a great world. Love your neighbor as yourself. A leader will be a servant to others. He's a great teacher. He really is. 
But if you have a teacher who's really great, you can say, hey, that teacher's pretty profound. But he's profound because he agrees with me. If he's a great teacher but you disagree with him, you simply say, I disagree. See, a teacher doesn't have any authority over your life either. So at times we actually treat Jesus like a consultant. We say, Jesus, I like what you just said there. I think I'll do that. But Jesus, I disagree with what you said there, or I don't like it, or it doesn't fit into what I want to do, so I'm just not going to listen. A lot of people say that Jesus had a lot of great suggestions, and they can choose whatever they want. But then they turn around and say, but he is kind of narrow-minded. He did say that he was the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but through me, and that's kind of narrow-minded, and I don't accept that. So if Jesus is just a great teacher to you, but that's all he is, you don't have the real Jesus. Then you got Jesus as the miracle worker. We read all about his miracles in the Bible. He's great, he's powerful, but we tend to treat Jesus, when we think of him as the miracle worker, we think of him as the magic genie. We go to him and say, will you help me? Will you solve this? Will you interfere over here? Will you turn this situation into something good? And you know he has all the power that's necessary to do just what you asked him to do. But if he is the miracle worker and only a miracle worker in your life, he is ultimately going to fail you. See, if we see Jesus as simply a great miracle worker back then who can fix my life now. But he doesn't have control over my life. He's more like the cosmic 911. Now, personally, I'm very thankful for 911, but 911 doesn't control my life. Did you know that Jesus walked by many people and didn't heal them and didn't feed them? In Acts chapter 3, and you don't have to turn to it, there's a story. Let me just sort of fill you in on what's happened. Jesus has died, he has been buried, he's risen again, he's ascended into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. The disciples now are going to the temple to pray. And they run into a beggar who has been crippled since birth. And the scriptures tell us that every day his friends had carried him to the temple entrance and sat him right at the gate so that as people came into the temple, they could give, them some, give him some alms so that he could leave or live. Jesus had been to the temple many times. He had seen that beggar many times, but Jesus never reached out and healed him. He could have, but he didn't. And I think he didn't do it because Jesus wants us to know that he is not Mr. Fix-It. He came to deal with our sin problem. And all the miracles that Jesus did just simply authenticated who he claimed to be, which was the Son of God, the Messiah, the coming King. And now we come to a fourth face of Jesus, and that is Jesus on the cross. And you say, okay, now we're getting into it. It's Easter. We love Jesus on the cross. He came to bear my sins. He came to bear the sins of the world. He came to lay his life down for us. But you know, if you only have Jesus on the cross... Dying for us, dying for our sins, offering us forgiveness, you still have an incomplete Jesus? Let me give you an illustration. There was this guy that was arrested, and he had two gold chains around his neck. One gold chain had a gold crucifix on it, and the other gold chain had a gold razor blade. And they asked him, why are you wearing a gold chain with a crucifix on it? And he said, because I am so thrilled that Jesus has forgiven all my sins. And they said, well, why do you have a gold razor blade? And he said, because I am so filthy rich, I can cut my cocaine with a gold razor blade. Now, when I heard the story, do you see any inconsistency there? I'm forgiven, but I can do this. So many people run around with gold crosses around their neck. 
but they've never had any lifestyle change. When Jesus died and said it was finished, he meant it was paid in full. But there was also something else that happened. The top of the temple veil was ripped by God from the top to the bottom. And the veil that separated the holy of holies where God was supposed to dwell was available now to people. God was saying, you can come to me by yourself. You can come to me through Jesus. And when you come to me, I will adopt you into my family. And I'll put my Holy Spirit within you. And my Holy Spirit will begin to change you from the inside out. And the truth is, people who know God follow God. And the cross is simply the centerpiece of their life. But it's not the whole story. The fifth face is the empty tomb. And you say, now you were going to get to the empty tomb. Well, we had to get to the empty tomb because that's the fifth face of Jesus. He is a living Savior. He has conquered death. And he can conquer anything. And because he lives, I know that my sins are forgiven. But he didn't just come out of the grave so that I can say, as he rose, I will rise also. Listen to Ephesians 1, 20 to 23 again. Listen to what it says. He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. He came out of the tomb so that he could be the king on the throne. He came out of the tomb so he could be the king on the throne. He came out of the tomb so he could reclaim his rightful place in, which is the king. He is the king who sits on the throne. Listen to Philippians 2, 5 to 11. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus rose from the dead so that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you really know Jesus, he will be your King of kings and your Lord of lords. And his resurrection lets him rightfully reclaim what was always his. Now, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16 talks about when Jesus is coming back from heaven to the earth to establish his kingdom. Listen to what it says. And I saw heaven standing open there before me. It was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ is coming back to reclaim and establish his kingdom on the earth. And you know that's really good news for some people. And that is not such good news for others. 
but he's waited almost 2,000 years to return so that some of those who are his enemies could decide to become his friend and his servants. We have all these faces of Jesus. We have baby Jesus. We have the great teacher. We have the great miracle worker. We have the Savior on the cross. We have one who came out of the grave alive, and he is one who's going to sit on his throne and reign over everyone. So what difference does having a king make? If Jesus is our living king, we bow the knee. You know, Philippians says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. You know, you don't mess with a king. You bow the knee. Nothing else will do. And if we bow the knee to him, he's going to set us free from an eternity in hell. He'll put his spirit within us. He'll change us from the inside out. And you will give him the steering wheel of your life ultimately because he knows what's best. And he will lead you. But you must bow your knee to him as Savior, as Sovereign Lord. The second difference it makes, if he's risen and he's the king, is to know that you're on special assignment. Listen to what it says in Colossians. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Every one of us is on the same assignment. That is that we are to represent Jesus well in everything we do, wherever we are, whatever place we're in, whether or not you're a pastor or a mother or a wife or a husband or a school teacher or a nanny or a principal of a school or a school board member or a student in school or a praise team member or a dad or a salesman or any, anything you are, whatever you are, represent Jesus well. He's your king. And that's what you do when you have a king. You represent your king well. And the third thing is this. If you have a king, you can't lose. You can't lose. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When our king, Jesus, hung on that cross, he absorbed God's wrath against my sin and your sin. He cried out, it's finished. And in that process, he did a remarkable thing. He won the war. I want you to think about this. I want you to go back to World War II, a little bit of history here. When the Allies landed in Normandy, the war was over. You say, well, not really. Well, there was some cleaning up to do. There was the march to Berlin. But Germany was done the moment Normandy was taken. It's just how it was. Now, you know where you're living right now, right here on the earth. And it explains why sometimes we think everything is working out just the way we want it to, and other times it seems like we're being defeated over and over again. Well, that means we're on our spiritual march to heaven. The Lord, though, has won the battle, He's up in heaven. Because in his timetable, he's waiting for more people to say, I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm going to do it his way. And he's waiting, and so we continue our march on to heaven. But if we know that our king has already won the battle, it changes everything. Sometimes I feel my life couldn't be blessed any more than it is blessed. And then there are other times it's not going as well as I thought it should go. But when I know that I, my Jesus is my king, I can deal with that because I know how the story ends. The book of Revelation tells me. We win. We win. Years ago, the United States Olympic hockey team was playing the Russian hockey team. They had all professional hockey players we had all amateur hockey players. And I remember sitting in my living room while that hockey game was going on, 
And I was sitting on the couch, and then I was kneeling on the floor, and I was clenching my fist, and I was a nervous wreck. I was just, the adrenaline was pumping. Could we possibly beat the Russians? It had nothing to do with hockey. Could we beat the Russians? Could we do it? And when the buzzer sounded, I jumped up and down. We won, we won, we won. Ah, what a great day that was. A couple weeks later, I decided to watch the replay. There was no fear that we would lose. There was no surprises that broke my heart. Why? Because I knew the outcome. And if you know the outcome, you don't sweat it. And that's how it is for you and me who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He's won. He was a baby, but he was God in human flesh. He was a great teacher. And everything he said was true, and the Bible's full of his teachings. And he was a great miracle worker, and he still does miracles today. He did hang on a cross and die for our sins in our place and pay the penalty for our sins and brought to us forgiveness. And yes, the grave is empty because he rose up from the grave bodily and he is our risen Lord and Savior and coming King and he wants you to come to him as Savior, as Lord, as King. As I've said it already twice today, if you come to him, he'll adopt you into his family. He'll put his Holy Spirit in you. He will change your life from the inside out. He'll begin to direct your life until the day you see him face to face. And he's left one question for all of us. Will you come? Will you come? Will you bow the knee? Let's pray. Lord, uh, some of us here have been so distracted with life that we've never really considered eternity. Well, we've heard of Jesus. We know about Jesus. Matter of fact, we're here today because Easter is about Jesus who died and rose again. But we really never gave it much thought. We know now that he's made heaven possible for us All we have to do is put our trust in him. We just have to step over that line. We have to say, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He's going to let him be my king. I'm going to bow the knee to him right now. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit come into my life. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit change me from the inside out. Lord, if there are people here just like that, may today be the day they bow the knee. Now, some of us have come here today and we don't, aren't normally here. Uh, we have enjoyed a relationship in the past with you. The fellowship and communion has been phenomenal in the past. But over the last few months or years, we've drifted. We've become, become distracted. We've stopped reading our Bible. We've stopped praying. We've lost the fellowship. We've lost the communion. We don't bow the knee anymore. I pray, Lord, that if someone fits into that category, that the day will be the day that they say to you, I'm coming back. I'm going to take back the ground that I've lost. I'm going to bow my knee again to you. I know you're my Savior. I'm going to let you be my Lord. I pray that the day that those that fit into that category will do business with you. And then there's some today who are here who are walking with you, have sweet fellowship with you, walk in communion with you. And today was a day that we came to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Receive our frank thanks, Lord. And help us all to leave here today ready to represent our Savior and our Lord well. And I pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>